Okay. Let's see. Um, let me actually stop sharing this for a second. And I had a few things that I wanted to discuss. So the biggest thing um, for worksheets, I'm not gonna allow late submissions on those, but they're, they're due on Friday at like 11.59. So you kind of, um, after, after class, you have a couple of days um, to finish those up and get them submitted. Um, yeah, Is question. Is the case that, like, I mean, you will go, like, basically do those in class? Yeah, we're going to do all the worksheets in class. So as, if. So it's like if maybe I'm watching it on the next day and watching the lecture later. Exactly. If you, if you have to watch the lecture the next day or, or whatever, then that's totally fine. Um, yeah, I, I just want people to like, you know, actually show up to lecture. <laughs> um, worksheets are just completion. Correct. Yeah. And uh, we'll give feedback. So we'll say like, if it's wrong, most likely the feedback will be, hey, go take a look at the solution. If it's right, well, we're not going to give you any feedback besides that it's right. Um, All right, um, so quick recap of where we were. Uh, how do I get rid of this? Maybe I can, let me do that. I don't know how to get rid of this bar here. Alt, there we go. Okay. So last time we, finished, we, we were uh, in the middle of discussing this performance equation. So I wanna do a bit of review of that um, before we get into uh, into some more more content. Um, so so the the key is that there's um, three terms. There's the instruction count. This is just the number of total instructions that we're executing. Uh, there's the cycles per instruction. So this is uh, the ratio between. Uh, the number of cycles required to execute the entire program and uh, the number of instructions that were executed. So it is key to remember, this is a ratio. Uh, this isn't, um, you know, this, this is an average. And then the cycle time is just the clock cycle in seconds. Multiply all of them together and we get latency because that's kind of what pops out the other end of the dimensional analysis down here. So this this uh, seconds is what um, uh, gets doesn't get canceled out, and that's our latency. Um, it's pretty obvious as well if you just look at the equation that if you reduce any of the terms. Latency goes down. So then we looked at how we can uh, reduce the cycle time. This is mainly a function of, you know, what the electrical engineers deal with. So let's mostly let them handle that. Um, clock speed. This is probably what you hear the most of it in marketing. You know, gigahertz, megahertz stuff like that. It is just the inverse of um, the seconds per cycle time, per, you know, per cycle. Um, and the reason is it's, it's bigger is better. And people like going and buying things that are bigger and better rather uh, more than they like going and buying things that are smaller and better. And if you use this, then, then basically what you need to do is then divide by the clock speed instead of multiply by the seconds per cycle. That's all. OK. We talked about instruction count. Um, specifically, the difference between 
uh, dynamic and static instruction count. Dynamic is the one we care about. It's the actual number of instructions that it get executed. Static is just your compiled binary, the number of instructions inside of that. And that's not very useful to us, right? If you have a for loop that goes to 10 million, and it does one thing inside of it, the static count is going to be very low. Dynamic is going to not be very low. OK. Some methods of reducing instruction count are, are algorithmic improvements as well as compiler optimizations. There's others, obviously. But these are two of the, the ones that um, are, are most evident and easy to, to, to look at. So um, let's see here. What is that? There's other factors that affect instruction count in addition to, to your um, algorithmic choices and compiler uh, option choices. Um, for example, um, different inputs. Uh, we'll look at that in a in a little in a little bit. Different inputs are going to be cha will change um, the amount of instructions that you're performing. Um, Different ISAs are going to as well. Uh, different um, uh, different programs obviously would as well. Um, and we have to be sure that whenever we're doing a comparison between two systems, they have to be doing the same task. So, for example, if you wanted to, if you were comparing the efficiency of like the performance of Clang versus GCC. You'd have to compile the same program, um, and you know that would, that might be a little bit iffy because you would get a different binary. But you know, like this, we can kind of ignore some of that stuff if we want. Okay. Then we got to CPI, which is the most complicated of the terms in this equation. Um, and really, this is where we're going to spend most of our time in the class, right? The instruction count that you guys had to take algorithms. So we'll let algorithms people do that, or we'll let the PL people do that, whatever. Um, we're, we're going to care much more in this class about these latter two, processor design memory system. Um, uh, and, and less about the inputs and the compiler. But all of these do have an effect. So again, I, I keep wanting to highlight it is an average. Just be aware of that as we continue on. So we did this um, worksheet problem last class. Here's the answer in case I'll pull that up. 13.7 um, is the answer. So in case you weren't here, there that is. You can also go watch the last lecture if you're confused about this, but it is just a weighted average. Um, so the last thing we discussed was how it, the instruction mix affects CPI. So different types of instructions have different latencies. Um, generally, integer instructions have much lower latency than a floating point operation, for example. And so, uh, Different programs are going to have different mix of these, which means that when we do our weighted averages, we're going to have to take into account, uh, take that into account. Um, for example, uh, we have second, which is a, a integer benchmark effectively, 
and Stack FP, which is a um, floating point benchmark. Uh, they're two different benchmarks for different purposes. But um, as you can see, there's a much different mix of instructions on each one of these. And this matters because um, we can be smart or we can be dumb about our selection of uh, instructions. We could, for example, if we were implementing a language like, I don't know, how about JavaScript, make everything a floating point number and then use all the inefficient ones that take three to five cycles instead of doing the integer ones, which take one. I think that sounds like a great idea and we should run all of the modern web on it. Um, okay. Lastly, um, I want to touch on the fact that program inputs affect CPI. Um, and ex just dive into a little bit of why this is the case. Um, if you, for example, have uh, some command line arguments, where if you pass in a certain command line argument, it goes down one path, another command line argument, it goes down another, then obviously you're going to be executing different functions. Your branches are going to go in different directions. And these are all going to affect the instruction mix. Um, and therefore, um, uh, the instruction count of the program. OK. Any questions before we continue on to the next worksheet problem? Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is a cycle? Ah, so what is a cycle? Great question. Um, so on a CPU, um, instructions are basically to, um, the CPU is is on a clock. Like there's a a, um, a voltage which comes at certain intervals, um, and when that additional voltage comes comes to the processor, uh, that's an indication of go ahead and start doing the next instruction. This is a bit of a simplification, but bear with me. Um, and as soon as you see this up uh, upward cycle of of the uh, of voltage on your CPU, then it'll do just a little bit more work. And when uh, we'll, we'll get into pipelining later, uh, we'll, we'll break down these instructions into many different pieces of work and do them in, in a sequence. Um, but just kind of think of it as a, uh, the cycle time as a, as the most granular unit of work that we can do uh, or granular unit of time in which work can be done. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Other questions? OK, so let's look at this worksheet problem. So um, a few things to, to observe here. We have a system. We have two systems, system A and system B. System A has some number of in instructions. CPI is 4.7 seconds per cycle, one nanosecond. Obviously, system B has the same kind of metrics, but 4 million and 2.3 cycles per um, instruction. And note this, this same program, that's pretty important here. This is the same program um, that we're running. So we can also assume that there's the same, same input as well. Um, so we're doing the same amount of work. And we want to calculate the speed up. So let me pull up. The speed up. Uh, 
Can you guys can you guys see that? Maybe I should zoom in. Can you guys can you guys see that? Okay. Cool. So I will I'll leave this speed up equation up for a second for a minute and then I'll leave this up. This is the this is just the second worksheet problem. And um raise your hand if you have any questions. Uh, Wyatt, you had a question. Yeah, so when it asks for the speed up of system B relative to system A, that's going to be uh, basically the latency of system B divided by the latency of system A. Uh, so I, it should be the uh, other way around. Other way around? Whenever, whenever you have down here, so the speed up of B relative to A. You always put the B in the the, uh, the thing, the B on the bottom, basically. Yeah, this is a great question. The question was, which one do you put on top? Which one do you put on the bottom? And uh, the way, one other way of thinking of this, um, and so this this slide has old over new. Another way of thinking about this is reference over your new innovative idea. Um, in this case, um, your reference system is system A, and your new innovative thing is system B, you, is, is kind of the way to think about it. Does that help clarify that? Yeah, that does help. Okay. Let me, since you guys have this on your worksheet, I'm going to just go ahead and Move that and pull up the, the worksheet over here and start, start writing some stuff. Should we be memorizing these equations? So you should definitely memorize. Well, okay, I mean, I'm probably gonna give you the exams open book and open notes. So you should know how to use them though. They're fairly intuitive once you have played with them a bit and you'll have to do it for the homework too. So I wouldn't worry about memorizing as much as I would worry about understanding. Um, I know that's kind of a fuzzy answer to this question, but. Okay. So, um, yeah, what we're gonna do is just multiply all these together. So um, the latency of the old one is just gonna be um, uh, latency of A. over latency B, so 3 million times 4.7 times one over 4 million times 2.3, one. Okay, um, millions cancel conveniently, yay. Ones cancel, obviously. And then what, what, what did you guys get as answers? 1.53, yeah, 
Cool. So yeah, this is a speed up of system B relative to A. So what can we what can we say from this? Um, first of all, we can see that the instruction count went up. It went up from three to four. So we're doing more instructions, but we're doing them way faster, like uh, almost half as fast or half as, it takes half, almost nearly half the time, uh, around half the time of uh, system A to do a single instruction. So we're gonna get a net gain. Um, and this is, this is an example of being able to, to look at some trade-offs and say, oh, maybe we should go with this new system. Um, what are some scenarios where this might be observed, where we have a, a larger instruction count and a smaller CPI? Anybody have any ideas? Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the answer for people on Zoom was, um, uh, we, we, oh crap, I'm running into a chair. Recompiled our program, different instructions, set architecture, um, and different platforms. So we're gonna end up with a different CPI um, and potentially a different instruction count accordingly. So yeah, totally. And Ethan in chat looks like he's mentioned CISC versus RISC. That's pretty much what I was trying to get at here. B would obviously be the RISC system. It would be the one that has more instructions, but they're way faster. Um, and A is basically, you know, is not a risk. It's, a, it's definitely a, a CISC. Okay, so um, yeah, as far, one other thing, if you're, since you're attending, you get, you get a little bit of extra credit. Um, just at the bottom of your worksheet, write one reason why the instruction count for A could be different than the instruction count for B. Um, just a few words and then mark that with EC uh, so that the grader can find it. And what we mentioned about um, different instructions that architecture is, is one acceptable answer. There are others. Um, okay. Any questions on this? Where do we get the instruction count from? Like in real life or like just in real life? Um, it's very difficult. I mean, so one thing that we'll do a lot of times is just ignore instruction count because it's gonna be consistent across our different systems that we're comparing. So we ignore it and don't care. Otherwise we're gonna have to do some, uh, Processors kind of like keep track of this stuff. So you'd have to, you know, use processor APIs to figure out which instructions you're, how many instructions you're actually doing. But like I said, a lot of times we can either estimate it or just cancel it out entirely because it's going to be consistent across runs. This is per application. Per application, exactly. And, and input, right? If you're doing matrix multiplication on a two by two matrix and a hundred by hundred, obviously instruction count is going to be very different. Okay. Could you uh, I saw, go ahead? Could you repeat what you said about the instruction counts being different in A and B. I couldn't really hear what was uh, said before. Sure. Okay. So so uh, why? 
can the instruction counts for A and B be different? Um, there's a few different reasons. Uh, one of them could be that we're dealing with two different instruction set architectures. Um, for example, um, if we compile this same program for x86 versus ARM, we're going to end up with a different number of instructions that get run on each of those two different platforms. Um, however, the CPI is is different on on x80 on you know an Intel x86 processor versus versus some like Snapdragon ARM processor or whatever. So. Uh, yeah, recompiling for a different instruction set architecture could end up with a different instruction count. Um, compiler optimizations could as well. So this would be something that compilers people, TL people would care about. Um, you know, if you choose some different instructions, you know, you're for, okay, so for example, right, like you could, in x86, use the floating point square root instruction to do all of your floating point square root. Or you could not. And you could just implement square root yourself. And then um, with, with more simple x86 instructions, you would end up with a different instruction count. Most likely, the CPI is still pretty much the same, though. So. Um, but that's another way that the instruction count could could be different. Does that help? Yeah. For this question, yes. We are assuming that the, the program is the same. I think it says here uh, we're running the same application, not necessarily the same executable. The same executable thing is the key here to allow us to have different different um, instruction counts, right? Because if it's if it's the same executable, then it's going to be the same binary. Like it's going to have the same um, same instructions. So we'll talk about ISAs later. Um, Yeah, so we'll talk more extensively about ISAs in a couple lectures. Um, and yeah, I'd say the compiler optimization, you know, it's to, we don't really care too much about it in this class, right? Like we're, we're doing architecture, not compilers. Um, we'll let Jed deal with that and, you know, make it, make it good. Um, okay. Additional questions. These are great questions, by the way. Um, so let's move on. Here's another worksheet problem. Um, And this time, I have not given you um, the instruction count, right? There's no instruction count on system A or system B. So uh, ideas of what you can do to still, still get an answer here. Any ideas? Yeah, so we're running the same program with the same inputs. Yeah, so the instruction counts the same in, in both. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I'll give you like a minute to do to compute this. And I'll... Oh, also, note the terms. Just be aware. They're, they're different than the last one.
Okay. Um, so it's important to note that we're we're dealing with instructions per cycle rather than cycles per instruction. So you're going to have to invert it. Um, so that gives us for a. Um, we we end up with one over 0.4 for B, one over 0.3. Okay. Also, we're dealing with clock speed, and clock speed is the inverse of um, seconds per cycle. Our, our our cycle time. So we're going to have to invert that as well. Uh, oh man, I'm, I'm running out of room. Oh well. Thankfully, gigahertz cancel out um, because if they didn't, that'd be kind of annoying. And then when you actually solve, what what do you guys get for for an answer? Point. Eight one. Yep. Um. Yeah. If you got if you got one point two three, that's probably the inverse. I'm guessing. So probably just put the wrong thing on top. Okay. So that's the answer here. Um, any any questions? Okay, so a lot of times we're going to be doing comparisons where we need to compare systems that are partially the same. So uh, an example is that we have the same program, but different CPUs. So maybe we have, um, we're trying to compare an Intel i9 with an AMD Threadripper, for example. But in this case, we would want to keep the program the same. Um, and, and do that comparison. Oftentimes we'll have the same CPU but different programs. This really matters if you're doing like algorithmic optimization. Um, and the the key is that in these cases we can just simplify our um, performance equation. We can just get rid of terms that aren't relevant. If the CPU doesn't change, then the cycle time is never going to change. Um, so we can just effectively measure our latency in cycles. Uh, so we can just um, get rid of the last term. We don't have to convert it to seconds. Cycles are going to be uh, constant across both, both systems. If the workload is fixed, um, instruction count isn't going to change. So this is we're running the same program, same input. So we can just measure performance and in instructions per second. Um, this is, we don't really care about the full number of instructions that uh, are being executed. Um, and then if we have both workload and clock rate fixed, then we can just measure latency in terms of CPI, um, where, where smaller is better. 
Um, and this is this might this is going to be really handy. For example, when we deal with stuff like um, memory hierarchy and comparing different memory optimizations, because we're going to be effectively keeping the CPU constant, keeping the workload constant, and looking at how our different you know caches or whatever are helping us or hurting us. Um, and those all are kind of bundled up in this CPI term. OK. Another way of thinking about this um, is you're basically using the speed up equation, but then just not canceling anything, not comparing anything yet. So like, you know, you're, you're kind of um, uh, uh, you know, on, a, on the same CPU, CT is constant. So you're just assuming, you're just kind of um, uh, assuming that it'll be canceled out eventually. Um, it is important though, that you can't just cancel stuff willy nilly that you just don't like and don't want to compute. Seems kind of obvious, but you know, just don't, unless they're identical, don't cancel them out across the system. Okay, question. Yes. To this one? Oh, wait. There we go. What do I mean by a workload? Um, so, program running on a particular input. Basically, another way of thinking about workload is the total set of all the instructions you get executed. And so, like obviously, if your if your program's the same and the input's the same, you're gonna get like computers are still deterministic, unless you have some random random number generator. But let's ignore that. Um, so, so that's that's what it's saying. Yeah, it, it, uh, exactly. Work, if the workload is the same, that's equivalent to saying that the IC is the same. Mm Okay, let's look at the last worksheet problem. This one's a little bit different. We're comparing two different, sim two different um, similar systems. Um, so we have a processor that's running at, currently we have a processor that's running at 4.9 gigahertz with a CPI of 1.4. Um, and we have some, we have two different options. We can either spend $10,000, hire a Mines, a CSM Mines graduate for two weeks, to optimize the algorithm so that it requires 37% less instructions to execute as, as before. Um, and we're assuming the same CPI, okay? So that's our option one. Option two is we can spend $1,500 and buy a new CPU that runs at 5.3 gigahertz with the same CPI and the question is, which option gives you the biggest performance gain per dollar spent? Um, so let's let's just kind of compute compute this and see see what how it uh, which one's better. Um, And I'll, I'll pull up this again for your reference.
Um, so by performance gain, effectively you should be thinking speed up. So, so our metric is, is like speed up per dollar. Okay, uh, so for the first one, um, what do we really care about? Which terms do we actually care about in our performance equation for uh, figuring out the speed up if we, if we if one of us get hired and, and do this algorithm optimization? So, all right. The instruction count is the one that goes down for the first one. Instruction count, exactly. Yep. Um, so this is the only thing we care about, right? We're this, on the same CPU, um, so our, our our cycle time isn't going to be changed at all, um, and our CPI isn't going to change because that's what the problem set. So, yeah, all all that matters is the instruction count. And um, easiest way I think to do this is just like just assume that we have IC of, of something. It doesn't really matter what. And then the the new instruction count is um, one minus three seven. So thirty seven percent less um, instructions. As before, obviously, instruction count cancels. You could also just set, set it to one, whatever. Um, and then, uh, I guess, then we just compute this. And what'd you guys get? Anybody have a number? 1.587, yeah. Yeah, so then then um, what we care about is uh, speed up uh, per, per uh, dollar mines. And then uh, what we end up with is divide divide the 1.587 by 
10,000. So we get a lot of zeros. One, two, three, one, five, eight. That's a five. There we go. One, five, eight. Okay. Then we do the same thing on the for getting a new CPU. Um, conveniently, the CPI is the same, so we don't have to worry about that term. Also, conveniently, the instruction count's the same because nobody got hired to do any optimization on the instruct on on that. Um, so all that changes is the is the clock speed. This um, so. That's nice. Um, again, it's important to to note that this is this is in um, uh, cycles per second. We care about seconds per cycle, so we have to invert. Um, so uh, the old one is one over four point nine. The new one is one over five point three. I'm just going to skip dealing with the gigahertz at all because they're just going to cancel. Um, luckily, that's going to be the case most of the time. You know, we aren't comparing stuff that's like 100 megahertz with stuff that's like 2 gigahertz. Um, so, no, most of the time you aren't going to have to deal with with changes like that. Okay, what would you guys get as an answer? One point oh eight one six, yeah. Okay, then divide this. Um the CPU over dollars. Um And everyone gets something like 0 0.0072 or three zeros and then seven two. Yeah. Okay, so unfortunately we're too expensive. Um obviously if you if you if you if you go with just getting a new CPU, then you're gonna get better performance gains per dollar, but um, um, you know we aren't getting as much of a gain, right? Like it's it's only base, it's under 10% uh, improvement, really. So you know maybe it's not maybe you actually need to get this this additional improvement. Um, but like I would say if I were a manager and presented with this option, I would look at it and be like, go buy the new CPU. If it's fast enough, then we're golden. If it's still not fast enough, we'll go, buy, we'll go hire a CU graduate and then we'll have them do a little bit more optimization. And then if all else fails, we'll go get the mines guy. Okay, so yeah, um, um, CPU is, getting a new CPU is probably the, better, the best um first first step um and then if that doesn't get you what you need then you can do some more optimizations any questions So um, we can drop terms from our performance equation, not just for speed up stuff uh, comparisons. Uh, sometimes um, this is a, a common application of just getting rid of terms, right? We know they're going to be constant, so we just get rid of them. But we can do, um, we can do it also for 
um, focusing on specific parts of, of the latency. So for example, um, um, we can get rid of instruction count and we only have CPI and, and, and cycle time. This is maybe convenient um, kind of for um, determining kind of a raw speed. Um, obviously we do have to set a specific CPI. We have to set, set a specific instruction mix for this to make any sense. Um, but like, let's just say we have, um, uh, we only care about floating point operations. We want to know how many of those we can do in a second. Well, that's actually a fairly common metric. It's it's flops, floating point operations per second, um, which is which is this guy here. Um, and this is measured in seconds over instruction instructions. Um, and you know this is this is somewhat useful, right? Because then you can kind of um, you can use it to compare systems, even though the instruction mix may be somewhat different. If you're still doing things that are more or less just floating point operations, uh, using flops would be a great way of, of approximating, approximating uh, how your latency would be affected. Um, and flops is, is this is again. This is a bigger is better metric. So it's the inverse of, of latency of the seconds per instruction, which is smaller is better. Um, again, people like seeing big numbers when next to flops on a supercomputer. You know, um, so yeah, we do have to we do have to fix our instruction mix or in the application. But like I said. We could just kind of pick that more arbitrarily than, uh, um, than a, you know, profiling a specific application. Here's another example of of why we might could, uh, of dropping term from our performance equation. Um, in this in this case, we're just dropping the cycle time, um, and so this is just the clock speed independent latency, um, the cycle count. So. Um, you know, this this might be this might be useful to kind of um, see how is our how is our for example our memory accesses uh, in combination with some compiler optimizations. How is that going to affect our performance uh, on a specific uh, specific machine? And this this is also useful, like. Um, we, we don't have to peg it to a specific machine even, right? We can just say, if you have a machine and you do this optimization, it gets you this much improvement um, and it can be all relative and not even pegged to a specific uh, cycle, cycle time. Okay. We can also just um, kind of rule of thumb our way to um, like some of these uh, some of these terms, because like I said, it's not it's not exactly easy to to compute these. It's not like Intel is not going to come out and publish like, yeah, our CPI is really bad. No, you're going to have to do some smart things to actually profile it and figure it out. Not to mention. Already, like the the CPI is just so hard to to figure out anyway because of memory and, and branch tradition and stuff like that. So, you know, a lot of times we can just make a guess. Um, we could say, for example, that modern processors the CPI is generally between one and two, and then just use um, use that as a use that as a guess. Um, we might still have the same instruction count. Again, instructions. You know, the other way of doing this, right, is you could you could trace. Your entire program and figure out the instruction count. It's totally possible. Um, uh, and then cycle time. Uh, that just you you could find that from your CPU, you know, 
um, many of, you know, because they, they publish cycle time. And then you just guess on the CPI, and this may give you a decent estimate of latency. Uh, another way of, of, another example of kind of rule of thumbing your way through through, through this stuff is uh, if you have a new processor, it's going to reduce CPI and clock time, um, cycle time by 50% by each. Then you can just say, well, let's just, you know, let's just as assume that it's approximately going to be that. It may not be exactly, but um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go with that estimate, right? Again, oftentimes an estimated latency is going to be enough, right? We can kind of be like, well, because, you know, we kind of really care if, for example, oh, this is going to make it really way worse or way better. If it's kind of equivalent, who, you know, it, it's, it's up in the air as to whether or not we care about a, a small performance gain. Um, again, you might, and in which case, then you would have to dig deeper and actually you know, compute these a little bit more accurately. Um, a few things of note. Beware of the of kind of guaranteed not to exceed metrics. Um, for example, and this is this is kind of like beware of marketers. Um, People will say stuff like this processor has speed of 10 giga ops or gig instructions per second. Um, this is this is equivalent to saying that the average instruction latency is going to be 0.1 nanosecond. But notice no workload is given. And the workload is important, right? Maybe they, they haven't specified, for example, that this is only integer instructions, for example with perfect branch prediction, right? Um, if you actually then um, uh, use that and try and, and, and use your own instruction count with that, um, um, instruction latency, it's probably not gonna give you very accurate uh, latency because Whatever they specified, you know, isn't real world usage. What it probably means, and this is again cutting through the marketer stuff, is that the processor is capable of 10 giga operations under absolutely perfect conditions. And it won't, it, the vendor is basically saying it's never going to go faster than this. Um, that's very, very different than saying, how fast it will go in practice, just obviously. However, you know, it, it could also mean that um, they're saying that this processor is going to give you 10 giga ops on an industry standard benchmark, which is maybe a little bit more accurate to what your workload will be. But again, probably not your workload unless you are running benchmarks and that is your workload. Okay. Any. Oh, uh, last thing. If you're ever curious what the fastest computer in the world is, there's a nice list, top 500, which uh, is at top500.org. And it's just the list of the, it has a list of the 500 fastest computers in the world. Uh, the cur so they, they report um, kind of the speed in, in floating point operations per second. Um, Oh, typo. Better fix that later. Um, using using Linpack, which is a matrix a dense matrix computation uh, benchmark. The current fastest is supercomputer Fugaku, I guess, in Japan. Um, it, the U.S. won the summit supercomputer just re like within the last year or two. Got eclipsed by this. So I'm sure, you know, it, it kind of, if you look at the chart, it kind of goes between like the US, Japan, China, like we're, we're all just like just throwing more ridiculous uh, hardware into these supercomputers. 
Um, but again, this is a benchmark. This is a, it's still a benchmark. Um, so there's other benchmarks that may be more accurate. For example, Graph 500 is kind of a another benchmark that is that is popular. Um, that that is kind of meant as a as a kind of counterbalance to this floating point heavy uh, benchmark. Um, and I don't know, I like graphs, so it seems kind of cool to me. All right. Any questions? So I'm going to finish up today by introducing Amdahl's law. We won't get through much today, but I just want to give you a brief overview of what it is. So Amdahl's law is, is the fundamental theorem of performance optimization. Don't ask me why we have to make everything fundamental laws or fundamental theorems. They seem kind of a little bit excessive to to say that, but you know, we got to we got to write papers on something. Um, as you might expect, a guy named Amdahl was the one who 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 made this law, and he was one of the designers of the IBM 360, which we didn't really touch on too much uh, on day one. But if we hadn't been invaded by another class, we would have. The key observation of Amdahl's law is that optimizations generally don't uniformly affect the entire program. So what's an example of this? Uh, if we optimize a specific type of instruction and your program, you know, has any other instructions besides that specific one that we optimize, then you're going to end up with um, a, an optimization that did not uniformly affect your entire program. It only affected the parts that were actually using that operation. So this leads to the conclusion that if we have a widely applicable technique, that's going to be more valuable. Uh, I'd say that kind of the the most widely applicable technique is just increasing your clock speed, decreasing your cycle time. You know that's going to affect the entire program. However, um, this also implies that if you have um, limited applicability of your optimization, it can reduce the impact of your optimization. So if you can only um, if your optimization only helps with 10% of your program, well, that's, gonna, that's going to not be able to impact your overall performance as, as much. And we always have to, to be aware of this. Um, it really is central to a lot of our optimization problems, both in computer architecture and in software engineering. Um, we'll get to this. A little bit later, but kind of the the another another um, inference that we can make is that we should start kind of with the big rocks first, right? We should start with the stuff that has the most widely applicable um, uh, optimization, right? And then, if that's not enough, we can continue continue finding. Um, more optimizations to to make. So let's look at an example. Um, let's just say that we have this new um, crazy super JPEG. Okay, maybe I should have updated this to be you know not 2010 ISA extensions, and it's going to in, uh, increase the speed of JPEG decoding by uh, by 10 times. And clearly, act now while supplies last. 
we'll probably throw in an extra um, uh, an extra optimization for you if you if you in very easy op, uh, in very small payments uh, if you if you order now. Um, but obviously there's there's some there's some problems in the small print. Specifically, this part increases the processor cost by 45%. So we have this new new ISA extensions, new instructions that our CPU can perform, but they're they're very expensive. We're gonna have to pay 45% more. So let's look at our uh, program. Um, we have some benchmark um, and it basically is gonna spend 33% of its time doing the JPEG decode. So we can see um, there's some, you know, probably some file IO at the very beginning, um, reading it into memory. And then maybe out here, it's doing some on the other side uh, after the JPEG decode where, you know, I don't know what we're doing, writing it out to disk again, something like that. So if we're doing 33% of our time on JPEG decode, how much is this, is this uh, JPEG or Rama going to actually help? Um, well, we can reduce this entire green thing down by a factor of 10. So that looks, so we've, you know, this is, if this was originally 10 seconds, now it is only one second for the JPEG decode. And we get uh, 21 seconds total because it, the, the optimization didn't affect either the, the beginning uh, or the end of our program. It only affected the middle. Now, if you look at this, compute the performance, what you'll notice is that 30 divided by 21, so old over new, is going to give you 1.42 times speed up, which is definitely not the advertised 10 times speed up. Um, very, very different than the advertised 10 times speed up. And it's because Amdahl's law is beating up our speed up. Uh, and again, it's back to that key observation. Our JPEG decode, you know, it seems really good to, to increase its speed by 10 times, right? But it's fairly narrowly applicable only to this, this one third of your program. So we're not gonna actually see that 10 times. So is it worth the 45% increase in cost? This is kind of always the question, is it worth, is it worth the money? If we choose um, a metric of latency times cost, again, we're just kind of making up a, uh, a useful metric for us to evaluate whether or not it's, it's good for us. Um, if we use this metric, we're gonna arrive at the answer that it's not um, because, you know, we, it's going to, um, we're only, you know, we're getting 1.42 times speed up, but our cost is going up by 45%, you know, for, and 45 is obviously bigger than 42. If we use a different metric, say we, um, in, instead of choosing latency um, times cost, we choose latency squared times cost. Maybe we really care about latency. Like um, we, we care about cost, but we really care about latency. In this case, we're just trying to weight it a little bit more. It would end up being, uh, it would end up being worth it. So do I have time? No, I don't. Okay. Any any questions about the overall? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, dollar amount. So in back like a couple slides, there was um, some, let me find it, some fine print uh, that says, as soon as it comes up, sorry. 
it increases the processor cost by 45%. So by, th by this, I mean, it's 45% more expensive. Yeah. And so that's, that's what I mean by cost. Other questions? All right, uh, you guys are dismissed. Um, the worksheet is going to be due on Friday. So just scan it in and submit it on Gradescope. Uh, if you have any trouble doing that, post on Piazza, send me an email, post in the matrix chat, do, you know, just, just let me know. That includes worksheet three. We will, Carter, I'll, I'll, we'll see. We'll start on worksheet three on Wednesday, and we may or may not get through it. If we do get through it, then it will be due on Friday. If we don't, then, well, it's going to be due on the next Friday. 